absolutely. That, that sounds great. Um, all right. If, if at any point um, people have like trouble reading stuff because of like text size and stuff, just let me know. Um, I'm still getting used to this. You can see a little bar snake here. Anyways, so uh, my name is Gabriel Ryan. Um, I'm an offensive security engineer at a uh, cloud provider. Uh, I'll say no more. Um, I used to work for a company called SpectreOps, and before that, I actually worked for uh, a company called Gotham Digital Science. Uh, so I've got a few years under my belt in the consulting world. Also, uh, uh, now kind of out of the consulting world, still, you know, just trying to stay active in the open source community and whatnot. Um, so this is a talk that has to do with initial access payloads. Um, so what are initial access payloads? So if you're not someone who does a whole lot of red teaming or um, would have a lot of exposure to this, um, it's an initial access payload is, to, is a payload that's used to gain access to a system or environment. So essentially, if you have an implant or some kind of shell that you're trying to drop on a remote uh, device, this is the thing that's going to set everything up for you. Um, pretty simple in design. Uh, it's, it's only job is to execute an implant or a second stage payload and you know pretty much get you off the ground. Um, they're also known colloquially as droppers or shell code runners. I'll probably be using the terms interchangeably throughout the, the talk, so just kind of bear with me on that. Um, yeah, so although, I mean, so initial access payloads, they perform a pretty like mundane task, at least like at face value, right? I mean, all they're, all they're doing is they're loading code into memory and executing it. Um, however, it, it does get a little more complicated than that because although, although you have this relatively simple task to perform, um, they're, the actual obstacles they end up facing in doing this stuff are, 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 can be pretty significant. <clears throat> Start out with, you know, you have to figure out a way to deliver the payload to its intended target. Um, this usually takes the form of sphere phishing, although there, there are other ways to, to do this. But um, you know, while you're in the payload delivery phase, you're going to be your payload's going to be exposed to signature-based detections, uh, both like at the mail filter level. Um, it's going to be also like exposed to automated behavior allowance um, analysis in the form of automated sandboxes. And then you know, finally, once you actually get it onto disk, uh, you have to do so without triggering antivirus. Then you have to execute it execute it without uh, triggering EDR. And that brings to execution. So the payload has to be executed from disk and uh, load shell code into memory without triggering antivirus or endpoint detection response, also known as EDR. Um, in Windows environments, uh, it gets even like it, it gets even more complicated because um, application whitelisting, like app, um, is, is pretty much ubiquitous on enterprise Windows environments um, specifically, and you'll see it on a lot of um, other types of environments as well. Um, so what this means is you have to rely uh, pretty much exclusively on, on what are known as live off the land binary or scripts or lawboss um, in order to actually get your payload running. Essentially, uh, what these are, it's it, any, like a lawbin or a lawboss, uh, essentially it's like a binary or script that usually comes with the operating system, although sometimes it's, it, it's just present on the environment. You don't really know why, but it, it's something that's there on the environment, um, usually, usually comes with the OS. And essentially, it allows you to... Um, it usually has some kind of like hidden functionality or, or, or what have you that um, allows you to do things that are useful as an attacker. So, for example, uh, there are a number of, of law bins that will allow you to uh, execute code, which is great because, you know, the, the law bin is, you know, not, it's whitelisted essentially. So if you're trying to bypass whitelisting, you feed your payload to the law bin and it, and it executes it for you. Um, but, you know, the downside of, of, of having to rely on law bins is that a lot of them, uh, when you are feeding your payload to them, uh, you're, you're feeding it to the, to the law bin um, in the form of a, a script usually. And, you know, within a Windows environment, they usually mean special basic or C-sharp, uh, um, which is all run through uh, Microsoft's anti-malware scan inter interface, um, which is which is not good because <laughs> it can look at your code and see what you're doing. So um, once you move past that, right, then you also have to, your, your payload, you have to assume that at some point it's going to be compromised. It's just an assumption you have to make. And when your payload gets burned, it's, it has to be able to withstand manual analysis from threat hunters and, and particularly reverse engineers, uh, because if they are able to figure out exactly what your payload is doing, um, that's where attribution happens. And also that is where um, um, it, it could cut your oper whole operation pretty short. So none of these obstacles are insurmountable. Um, it's been done over and over again. It's just a giant cat and mouse game. Um, but the important takeaway, though, is that it, the, evasion, the actual evasion techniques that you use to, to overcome these obstacles all have a relatively short uh, shelf life. Uh, defenders will eventually catch on to what you're doing. I mean, there are some pretty smart people working on the blue team. 
And they tend to write, you know, especially they're writing heuristic based detection. So they're looking for patterns of behavior rather than just static signatures. Once, once they identify that, you have to pretty much move on to something else. Um, and, and this is really why we do red team engagements, right? It's to, it's to kind of this, this interplay between red and blue, right? Between offense and defense is overall how we improve, you know, like our, our security postures. But, you know, what this means for, for you as a red teamer is that specific payloads, you know, your evasion techniques are, are, are going to have a short shelf life uh, to begin with. And specific payloads, um, so specific implementations of those techniques are going to have a, an even shorter shelf life. Because whereas um, there's a little more work involved with uh, writing a heuristic based detection, uh, signature based detection is pretty fast. I mean, you just need to grab a hash of whatever the payload is. And, you know, if you see that pop up anywhere, you, you fly on it. Um, and actually, the, you know, they're that kind of detection that provides a lot of value for defenders because it gets rid of a lot of noise and you can focus on the, I guess, the more sophisticated threats. Um, but what this means from, from an average series perspective is that reusing payloads over and over again is likely to get you burned, which is not great. Um, and this kind of, you know, makes initial access payloads kind of a major pain point for offensive teams because you, you usually have to write them by hand or at least modify them. Um, there aren't a whole lot of great ways to automate that. I mean, there's, there's a lot of like, kind of semi, semi like imperfect ways to do it. But, um, and the more, the more code you reuse, the more problematic this is and the, the more likely it is that someone's gonna uh, trigger on it. So, you know, essentially what you have is like, there's this very simple purpose. Essentially all, all this work is going into just launching your, your, your implant, right? And starting the operation. And to do that, you actually have a lot of moving parts that despite the fact that this overall purpose is super simple. Um, so Drop Engine is a project that I came up with to, to kind of make this a little bit easier. And, you know, it's, it's kind of its, in its infancy right now. It has its overall, I guess, um, you could say, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to keep growing. But essentially, it addresses this problem by providing a valuable framework for creating shellcode runners. Um, the core idea is to, you know, basically look at all those uh, components that actually go into initial access payload and, and, and you know, kind of isolate them as discrete components and then modulize them. And, you know, this lets you do is you can kind of mix and match, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, different, uh, you know, payload attributes and put them together into something cool. And then as a bonus, <coughs> see if you lose my voice, um, as a bonus, uh, it also provides built-in obfuscation, encryption, and symbolic substitution, substitution capabilities, uh, which makes it pretty easy to evade signature-based detections. So what this does is it, it, the idea is that you, you can do this to greatly extend the shelf life of your, of your payload components, which makes you operate more efficiently. Let's talk about how it works. Um, in order to really understand how drop engine works and, and what it does, we kind of have to talk, go a little bit deeper into how initial access payloads are built. Um, so at their core, initial access payloads are, are, are pretty simple, as we talked about. They really involve two major steps. Um, you load the shell code into memory, and you execute it. Uh, if only things were always so simple. But um, yeah, so the terminology here, uh, just because this kind of matches up with the component that we refer to drop engine, um, we'll refer to the routine that performs these two functions as the executor or executor routine or executor function uh, from this point onward. So if you hear me say executor, we're talking about a subroutine that, that literally does this, right? Load the shellcode into memory, execute it. Um, so there are many ways of achieving shellcode execution. Um, you know, there's DLL injection, spawn a thread, I mean, you could do P injection, there's process hollow, there's, there's all kinds of ways to do this. And it just kind of keeps growing. <laughs> um, but, I, I, you know, I, I think what we actually want to do is we want to kind of abstract away from specific uh, details of this, zoom out a bit, and and kind of look for like a broader pattern. Um, also, I mentioned that, uh, um, you know, application and whitelisting is, is, is ubiquitous. So we have to look at how you know, when I, when I said there are actually two steps, there's there's really three steps involved. Because remember, we have to load our shellcode into memory using a, like a, a lull bit of some kind. So really, we actually have three basic components when we actually look at the context of executing this environment where we have to use lull bus. <coughs> so these three basic components are the shellcode runner. Um, I know this whole thing is technically the shellcode runner, but you know, if we're looking at components, uh, let's just call the outer wrapper that can be executed using a law bus or law bin or a shellcode runner. Um, our payload main is our, is, is our application entry point. So this is the function that's going to be calling our executor function. And finally, we have our executor function. So you kind of see the structure here, right? 
And, and that's what's actually going to be loading our shell into memory and executing it. So Drop Engine actually implements these basic components as, as base classes. That's like the, the fundamental where everything is built off. Of. Um, these are all isolated, and you can just, if you're writing a module for it, you can just inherit from them. Um, you know, you can choose any kind of executor you want and wrap it in any kind of shell code runner you want. And the overall structure of the payload remains the same, uh, which gives you a lot of flexibility. And also, you could figure out, by the way, it's like if, if a specific part of your payload ends up getting burned, you can just replace it. It's um, you know, one, one of the, uh, the, the the biggest innovations for you know modern infantry was the development of replaceable parts. You know, you no longer had to replace the whole musket um, if something breaks. You just replace a component. That's kind of the same concept here. You know, um, just to kind of look at a less abstract example. So this right here. Um, This should stay executor. Uh, pretend it does, <laughs> but um, yeah, this this basically corresponds to this. This is this is not my code. This is um, actually from a uh, move kit. Uh, so I, I think it's actually based on something Casey Smith wrote, and then um, uh, Steve Flores is actually turning it into something else. Uh, but this is a, a, an MS build payload. So essentially, the way an MS build payload works, it's an XML file that's used for compiling. Um, well, it's it's it's. I guess intended purpose is, is for essentially allowing you to compile uh, Visual Studio projects without having Visual Studio actually installed in the system. So pretty cool from a developer's uh, perspective. Um, but from, from an adversary's perspective, you can also have it run C-sharp um, code, which, you know, because it's on every system everywhere, uh, essentially it, it's a really easy way to get around application whitelisting. Um, so you can see here that, you know, it. This actually, this payload actually does follow this pattern that we that we mentioned. If you're out of wrapper, and that's this this XML that you see, and then you have your payload main, which literally all it's doing is just calling this shellcode inject main, and then you have your your that down there, your actual class shellcode inject, and that's your executor, and that's where everything is is actually being run from. So um, that's how a basic payload works. Um, we we did mention that you know. So essentially, to maximize your chances of, of success, you should pretty much always protect your payload with some form of encryption. Uh, what this does is it prevents your, your, your signature-based detections from flagging on your, on your shell because it's malicious, and it makes it a lot more difficult for human analysts to reverse engineer your, your payload. Um, so if we take that 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 um, process that we talked about earlier, if we, if we tack on the encryption step, um, your, your payload execution process looks like this. You load the encrypted payload into memory, you decrypt it, Using an encryption key to obtain plain text shellcode, and then you load the plain text shellcode into memory executed. Um, so, if we're going to start encrypting our payloads, though, that actually presents another problem. What do we, you know, where do we get the encryption keys, right? Because you're you're encrypting a payload and storing it on something that's going to go on an adversary's um, adversary system, um, and then you're going to have to decrypt it. You're going to need the same encryption key, right, that you that you encrypted it with. So, um, in this case, uh, I mean. We talked about earlier, you, sh you should always assume that your payload is going to get um, compromised at some point. And if you're storing the encryption key on the payload, then you know whoever is, 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 is looking at your payload could just grab the encryption key and use it to, um, uh, to, to decrypt everything and see what you're doing. So it, it kind of defeats, the, it's, it's self-defeating essentially. Um, but with that said, you know, we essentially have three options um, uh, if we're going to uh, encrypt our payloads. We can we can derive the encryption key. We can give the, our, our payload the ability to derive the encryption key somehow, and that prevents us from having to store it. Um, we'll go into that in more detail in a second. Uh, we can also retrieve it from a remote source. That's a pretty secure way of doing it as well. Um, or we could actually just like store the encryption key on the payload, which is, you know, it works for passing bypassing signatures, but the second a human looks at it, it's gonna be less than optimal. Um, so let's talk about the first option, though. You know, how how do you derive an encryption key on a, on a um, on a payload in a way that a human analyst, you know, essentially couldn't figure out how it was derived from? Um, classic way of doing this is environmental keying. This is not a new technique. It's been around for, well, it's been documented for several years. But you know, it's I, I imagine it's been in in, in, um, in in practice for a while. If you, if you, I don't know if you guys remember Stuxnet, right? It was that. Uh, um, that malware that was infecting Iranian centrifuges. That, that's more or less how this worked, is using environmental keying. It's how they're able to, to uh, you know, target specific types of devices um, uh, with, with high degrees of accuracy. Essentially, the way environmental keying works, 
um, is that you derive the encryption key uh, entirely in part or in part from values within the environment. Um, so for example, you derive the encryption key from, you know, like an internal FQDN, an external FQDN, um, you know, your username. So if you want to target specific users or user groups um, or, or even the hard drive serial number, if you want to get really pre precise. And essentially what this does is, is you, you feed those into that. When you're actually encrypting the payloads, you drive your key from that. And uh, then when you're decrypting the payloads, the first thing you do is you, you grab those values and use it to, to derive the, the, the decryption key. And of course, if you aren't on the intended target, you know, it doesn't have the right serial number, it doesn't have the right username, that, that encryption key is gonna be wrong and the, the payload is not gonna decrypt successfully. Um, it's a really good way of turning a, a reverse engineer into a password cracker, essentially, because if, you've, if you're really clever about this, they actually have to guess, um, you know, what the serial number is gonna be. And that, that could take a lot of work. And that's what you want, you're buying yourself time. Um, so the advantages of this technique, it's very targeted. Uh, your shell code will only be decrypted on machines that match the key specific attributes. Um, you know, like if you want to go after one person by infecting a million machines, this is how you do it. Um, also, it's highly resistant to analysis. Uh, the encryption key is not stored on the payload, and it's it's very difficult to guess. Um, and all right, <laughs> here's where we try to do this live demo thing. So this is going to be interesting, right? Um, I'm going to do some screen flipping for a second and I have to figure out how to do this using. Right, okay, so first things first. I want you to see this. Okay, so this is full transparency. This is my, my current AV setup on this machine that I'm running off of. Um, I have Defender turned on, although I don't have automatic sample submission or cloud delivery delivery because I don't want this stuff getting pushed up to the, the cloud <laughs> at this time, um, you know, because demo gods and everything. Um, also, but I do have an exclusion set, right? And that is this folder here. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, in, a, in an actual scenario, what you'd be doing is you'd be uh, taking your implant and then you'd be obfuscating it somehow, then executing it on someone else's machine. So obviously the, the machine that you're, you're, you're obfuscating it on probably wouldn't have AV turned on. In this case, I'm kind of doing everything on like one or two machines. So, and, and both of those steps are happening on this machine, the execution and the, the obfuscation. So if I didn't do this, what would happen is that the second I try to load that payload into memory from the obfuscation framework, it would trigger antivirus, which is kind of, you know, counterproductive to, to, to demonstrating this. So essentially anything in this directory, um, it's AV isn't gonna trigger on. With that said, that's only one directory. When we actually demo, demo this, the, the finished payload is not gonna be executed from the exclusion directory. Okay, so just going back here really fast. Now I'm gonna switch again to Hyper. Yeah, this is it's a cool text editor. It's written in JavaScript, but it has been kind of buggy lately. So if I have run the problems, I do apologize. Um, so the first thing I do, LS is not found. That's off to a great start. Okay, that worked. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is, and I've got these just because I don't want to have the, you know, I've got these pre-written down because I don't want to waste time trying to, you know, fumble around with commands. But essentially what we're going to do is we're going to run it. Essentially we're going to say, you know, pass it this argument here, build. Uh, we're going to pass it. Um, this is just a, this is this is a um, m2 shell.bin is, is an interpreter payload. So, if anything is going to trigger AV, it should be this, right? Um, then we have our, our our interface. We're gonna we're gonna this is gonna be a C sharp payload. That's why we're specifying that interface uh, for the purposes of, of of Drop Engine. You can think of the interface as like the glue that holds all the components together. Uh, so if you're writing a C sharp payload, you use the C sharp interface um, encryption key. We're gonna use a static encryption key. So this is actually gonna be stored on the payload, uh, but it will show us you know just kind of what we're doing. And we also have a decryption key, which is the, the matching, you know, algorithm, essentially, that's going to actually be on the payload itself. Uh, we're using AS encryption. Um, and then uh, we're just going to use a virtual alloc thread um, executor. And it's going to be an MS build shell code runner, which we're going to be using a lot just for the sake of consistency and not messing up these demos on, uh, on a live Zoom meeting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy this, which is essentially just that command right there. And I'm going to run it. And we should have a payload here, right? And now I'm going to 
set up a, set up a um, session there. I'm going to use MS Build to run this thing. And you've got a session. The session stash I, session 21, because I was practicing earlier. And I'm just going to exit this. So that's just a basic statically keyed payload. Um, you want to know what a, uh, um, an environmentally key payload would look like using this process. You will look at this. Same deal. This time we are deriving the encryption key from the external left QDN. Um, yes, this is my external left QDN. Don't worry, it's going to change immediately after this talk. <laughs> and also the current username. Um, and I'm going to just go ahead and do this. This is also going to be an MS build payload. Because that lets me do this. I'm going to restart my listener. So you'll see essentially it worked. Um, oh, other ID. Yeah, so that's that. However, watch what would happen, for example, if I if I specified the wrong username, right? So if, if we didn't know the username that this was targeting. So I'm just going to put like two A's after that, right? I'm going to my jobs just to be safe. I'm going to start my, my reverse handler. I'm going to execute my payload again. And you see this, that failed. So the reason why that failed is that the, the decryption didn't work. Um, so, I mean, a username is pretty easy to guess, but imagine if that was like a hard drive serial number, essentially you just, it just wouldn't work, right? And that's the, that's the fundamental thing about um, environmental keying is it'll only work on, the, on your target system if you do it right, which is great. Um, I'm gonna switch back to, figure out how to do this. Let's switch back to my PowerPoint. Cool, all right. Here we go. Computers. All right, so just another, another cool thing that, that I added, um, symbolic mutation. So essentially, um, you know, actually, let me let me generate another payload really fast so I can show you. Well, yeah, yeah let, me, let me do that really fast. Actually, I'll show you in a second. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so essentially, like, you know, one really almost like necessary, to be honest. I mean, you should pretty much always be doing this. Is if you're running something like a C-sharp payload, and you're using it multiple, multiple times, you should really, you know, basically look at every single variable name in that payload. Uh, because remember, this is this is kind of a pseudo compiled language, but it can just be, it's like Java, you can essentially decompile it and just look at everything in the payload. So uh, because it can be analyzed that way, you really should, you know, get in the habit of every single class name, every single function name, every single variable name um, needs to essentially be substituted for something else every time that you run the payload. Or at least on every op, because you know otherwise people start to signature on your stuff. Um, the problem is doing that is a pretty lengthy process. I mean, some some payloads can be like a thousand lines long, and have a lot of variable names. And there's a bunch of different ways to do it. I mean, um, actually, uh, some of the guys from MDSEC had this thing that they released a while back where they're using um, some like Azure DevOps to like you know call this. I think it was like some specialized compiler. Essentially, they were building a tree, an abstract interact tree, I think, out of it. And, and and going through doing it that way, you can use like regex, but it'll it'll you know mess up a lot essentially. <laughs> um, so one thing that I wanted to do right out of the bat was was add a really easy way to do symbolic mutation, which is just you know you use an algorithm to, to change all this stuff. Um, and you know essentially you know the, the way the drop engine does this um, is that it it has mutator modules, but they're not actually payload components. But essentially, before the payload is rendered, um, the the combined list of symbol symbol names for for every single module is passed to a mutator function. And the mutator function does one thing, one thing only, and that it just takes those symbol names and it maps them to something else. And you know, essentially, the the um, the algorithm for doing that is like up to the to whoever wrote the module. So I mean, you could if you, it's, and they're pretty easy to write. So if you have like a mutation algorithm, you could just kind of toss them in there. And it's pretty easy to do. 
um, currently supported methods for mutation, um, <clears throat> you know, map to random strings, essentially just substitute all the variable names and simple names for, for random strings. There's row 13, I clear that there just as a proof of concept because it's both easy and funny. Um, there's also a uh, symbol substitution using a word list. That's actually super useful because if you want to make your payload not stand out, stand out as much, you can essentially just create a word list out of you know, existing innocuous programs and you know take variable names from real stuff that actually should be running on the target environment. Um, and then you know use that to, to create your, your word list. Um, and also there's a null mutator that just doesn't do anything at all. Um, and that's mainly there for debug debugging purposes, but I don't know if you don't want to use any mutation, that's how you do, do that. So just to kind of quickly show you how mutation works, I'm going to switch again to hyper. There we go. Um, all right. So By the way, for this one, I'm not going to be using the actual Metasploit payload. I'm going to be using essentially this little dummy payload here that just is something that's called a bin file, but it's really just a text file that contains the statement. Um, the reason why I'm doing that is because the actual ooh, didn't work out a little bit. Okay. Yeah, the um, the actual Metasploit payload is pretty big, so it, it's kind of hard to walk through. So if you want to see, for example, what, what the null mutator looks like, it doesn't actually mutate anything. Um, well, that's lovely. So it's just not getting everything. Uh, which one else again? I ran into this problem earlier. It was kind of finicky. Okay. Um, this, this should work. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is your actual payload, right? And, you know, here's all your stuff. And you can see essentially that it's not, well, it should be mutated. Oh, no, 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 we want this to say mutated. No. Okay. There we go. So here's your payload main. There's your actual payload. Um, you know, here's essentially where the decryption happens and here's where the execution happens. Your executor's here and your decryptor's up here. But you notice, you know, nothing has changed. Now watch what happens if we instead say mutator random string. Well, we kind of saw that earlier. Suddenly, all these variable names are randomized. So good luck signaturing on that. <laughs> and, you know, if you want to see the wordless example, um, you know, let's say, say heavy act. Yeah, I'm just going to try to copy this guy and hope it works. So, and here's how the word list went. No, it didn't work, did it? Okay. I'm going to need a terminal. This is I'm just copying and pasting, but not really copying and pasting. All right, you know what I'm going to do. Let's go up and say mutator. List. There we go. Yeah, so I'm just using a words list that substitutes everything for games of cities in the US. <laughs> but I mean, you know, once again, you could you could use a more a more um, I guess realistic word list. So yeah, that is um that's symbolic mutation. Let me I'll switch you guys back. PowerPoint. All right, there we go. Um, cool. So now we covered that. Um, there actually, we, we mentioned some other keying techniques, right? There, we, we went over um, environmental keying, uh, but we also mentioned, you know, retrieving keys from remote sources. Um, so that is that's a technique called remote keying. Um, so essentially, the way remote keying works is that you know the shellcode encryption key is retrieved from you know, a server somewhere, you know, either over HTTPS, DNS, or some other communication channel. Um, this is actually a really effective technique, especially if you have a really well-designed non-attributable attack infrastructure. If you want to know what I'm talking about, uh, go check out uh, the Red Team Infrastructure Wiki by Jeff Dimmick, which is a compilation of a lot of different stuff about this, but it'll go over all this stuff. But um, yeah, essentially, if you place your, your you know, key server behind a redirector, this is, this is particularly effective. Um, 
but essentially the idea is that you you, you run your payload and you basically make like a get request or an HTTP request or, um, or, or reach out somewhere and, and grab the encryption key. And that way you don't have to store it on the payload. Um, of course, you know, the question is if an analyst analyzes your code and, and they find the function that's retrieving this key, well, what's stopping them from going and, and you know, hitting the same API endpoint somewhere and, and you know, trying to uh, get the encryption key that way? Well, that is where one, team, one time remote keying comes in. It's a variant of this technique where the server actually tries to delete. Um, essentially, the, the server, you know, as soon as you make that get request to the server, once the key is retrieved from the server, it's deleted. Uh, from the server's database. So any future requests for that key um, will will not return anything. They'll either return, they'll either be ignored or return junk data. Or um, if you want to be really sneaky, redirect to something completely innocuous. So like, hey, it's just a normal website. Um, but yeah, once again, the advantages of this very similar to um, uh, you know essentially the environmental keying. It's it's um, it's resistant to analysis. You're not storing the encryption key in a payload file, and it can be also be protected in transit using TLS. Um, also, the advantage is that it's significantly less targeted, right? This, this doesn't really help you when it comes to, uh, or at least as much right out of the box, uh, when it comes to like ensuring your payloads execute in the right place. But sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you want a payload that is 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 highly secure, but less targeted. You know, so for example, if you want to hit a particular organization, or even like a user group within an organization. That's still like a pretty easy thing to guess, especially like, oh wow, this organization's been infected by malware, right? You know, how are we going to, um, you know, decrypt this key? Well, let's try the domain name. You know, it's, you don't always want to be specifying like a hard drive serial number. So if you combine that stuff with the um, with the remote keying, uh, it, it can it can kind of help you have a slightly less targeted attack, a broader attack uh, uh, of that area of effect essentially, while uh, uh, still getting that that that. Um, the security for your for your inner payload. So another live demo, and show show you how that works in, in Drop Engine. Um, all right. So, oh wait, I'm not showing my thing, aren't I? Okay. I need to get a better setup for this. I'm not used to this. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So here's some. Um, Here's the syntax for that essentially. So we're going to do two things. We're going to run this this remote OTK server. It's just a very simple uh, POC for this kind of thing. Essentially, just to key server that behaves in the way that we just described. Um, and then we're going to run the, this uh, this drop engine command. We're going to run the build command to build our payload. Um, but we're going to pass it the you know IP address essentially and protocol for our, our key server and you know, port and all that. Um, and that's where it's going to get the payload. So. First thing we're going to do is we're going to start that, that one time key server over here, this bottom left terminal. If copy and paste is an L, I don't need to copy and paste this. <laughs> Apparently, I do. And for the debugging command, you know, just in case it goes wrong, not that I really anticipate it, but you know, I'll dump tap the demo gods like ever. Mistake you only make once. All right. Cool. So that looks like it worked, despite the fact that it looks a little janky because I'm zoomed in. But yeah, so looks like it ran. Um, I'll set up our handler again here. I'll have any sessions or jobs. Start a handler. <clears throat> Are going to execute this thing now. Notice here, essentially, we've retrieved this implant ID, right? Or we, we, we the, the server has received this implant ID and it's returned this remote key, right here. And you know, the payload was able to use that that remote key uh, to decrypt itself. And now it's this interpreter session has been opened up. And I'm going to kill the interpreter session because I'm going to make another point. <laughs> Okay. Well, I could have sworn I had a curl command to do this way. Yeah, here we go. No? Okay, well, I'll see if I can get this thing. Hang on. 
So if I if I if I curl local local host right, and where it's being hosted, and I, I give it this ID again, what should happen is that yeah, remote key is done. So so essentially, it's it's received this, and you can see the response to this. Um, it's just got a bunch of garbage data essentially, because we've, we've already used that encryption key, it's been exhausted. Um, so it gets executed once, and then if someone tries to replicate what the payload did, uh, they can't. Unless they get another payload which hasn't been executed yet. But, all right, so just to wrap up the keying section of this, um, the last thing I wanna talk about is key stacking. Let's see if I can get this flip back over. All right, so what is key stacking? This is, um, key stacking is not a real technical term. Well, I guess it is now, but like I, I'm, uh, this is one of the things that like, I'm pretty sure like this is something that's been done by malware for like a decade at least. Um, but I needed a, a term for, I needed a way of labeling the process of essentially taking a bunch of keys, and, you know, putting them together. So I'm, I'm calling it key stacking, but um, essentially it's the practice of combining the results of multiple key methods to create a single combined key. Um, you know, so you're, you know, for example, you have a key that's made of four parts. Uh, you could grab the hard drive serial, not serial number, an external IP address, um, you know, and also like a, um, a one-time key uh, that's stored in the payload file um, and also a one-time key that is uh, retrieved over HTTPS. Um, so the advantages of this, um, you know, is, is essentially you can you can get all the, the best attributes for all the different key types this way. Um, it gives you a high degree of security, uh, uh, difficult to compromise. Um, you know, you can you can make it as targeted as you want. Essentially, essentially. Uh, the disadvantage of this is going to be that um, you know this is the more you know key derivation methods you put in your payload, the more complicated this gets, and the more work you have to do. Unless you're using a framework, which is kind of what we're doing here. So, but yeah, just to give you a better idea of how key stacking works. So, you know, let, let's rewind a little bit, right? So we've we've added um, a dynamic keying to our to our payload. Um, so we we had that original architecture that we talked about, where we had those those initial components. We actually have to update that once more to add this stuff to it. Um, you know, we we see our our, our, our usual suspects, the, the, the components that we saw earlier, right? We have our payload main, um, which calls everything at this point. It's not just calling your executor, it's calling everything. Um, it's coordinating everything going on your payload. We have our, our shellcode runner, which is like your outer wrapper, and that's just responsible for kicking off payload main and is usable by a, a law bin or, or law boss, right? Um, you also have your, your decryption routine. And what that's doing is that just taking your decryption key and decrypting your shellcode. So it takes both your shellcode and decryption key as inputs. Output is plain text shellcode, which can be understood and executed by the executor. Um, as far as how we were getting those keys, we essentially have a series of subroutines that um, are performing key derivation. We don't have to worry about how they're performing key, key derivation. It's, we, it's, it's more advantageous that we can sit in a black box uh, for the purposes of, of building something like this. Uh, but essentially, you just you know take the output of uh, you basically just depend all the outputs of all of your keys to one another, and that's how you get your your, your final encryption key. And in fact, I'll even show you that. Well, actually, I'll show you that in a second because I don't have to keep switching back and forth between Hyper and PowerPoint more than I have to. Um, but this is your updated payload architecture. Um, you know, the, the kind of what we saw before. Um, we talked about the interface earlier. It's the glue that's holding all this stuff together, right? Um, if you kind of want to know how, the, how that's actually working, uh, if we're going to encrypt payloads, essentially your shell code is going to be passed to the interface. Your encryption key functions are going to be passed to the interface. Um, the interface is then going to pass that combined data up to your cryptor, which is then going to send it back to the interface. This is this is cool. Like if you're actually if you're interested in how kind of like things work at a low level, like with a drop engine. But if you don't care, that's fine. That's totally understandable too. <laughs> but essentially, this is kind of what it's doing. It's just taking the stuff, passing it to your cryptor that you select back to your interface, and then finally just kind of takes all that stuff and puts it in payload main for you. Um, and inter the interface is facilitating communication between all these components that are doing all these things. <laughs> 
And this is our live demo. So now we're the most complex demo so far. So let's uh, let's do this. All right. Back to Hyper. Be a demo stack file, which is like a little cheat sheet here. All right, cool. So here's our, our, our command that we're going to run. Um, and we've, we've kind of been doing this already. I just haven't really been telling you. <laughs> but uh, you can see here, everything kind of looks similar to what we were doing before. This time we have lots of different encryption keys that are going to pile on top of each other. Uh, we have our e-keys flag, which are encryption keys, um, and then our corresponding t-keys flags, uh, right? So the, the, the first round is going to be, uh, essentially, we're just going to be pulling the external FQDN um, and using that as the first part of our key, then our username, then a, a static uh, nonce that we're deriving, then a, a you know one-time remote key, like we saw earlier. So we're, we're going to take all this stuff that we saw and use it to create one big encryption key, which... Personally for us, now just to be thorough, I'm gonna actually restart this, this thing right here. Right. I don't have any doing anything here. Start a payload handler. So far, so good. <laughs> I haven't had any failed demos yet, so I'm pretty happy about that. Oh well, knock on wood. Right. Yeah, we're gonna run this and it's gonna it's gonna build our thing. And it worked. Cool. Session 24. Sweet. All right. So I'm actually going to exit that. So I mentioned I'd show you kind of what the actual combined remote key looks like. If I rerun this command, the build command, this time instead of using our actual our actual implant, implants interpreter. Version of it's <laughs> and we're just going to use that shell.in file, which, if you remember, it's just a text file. Uh, also, fun fact the reason why this particular string is useful for testing cryptographic stuff is that it has every letter of the alphabet in it. So, if you want to see if your encryption is working or not working, that's that's a classic one to use. Not that I really know anything about cryptography at all, but I know that. <laughs> all right. There's an example. All right. So this is essentially, uh, let's use a mutator. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I use the random string mutator. It's going to kind of be counterproductive. <clears throat> So this is our, our MS build payload, kind of similar to what we've been, been saying. Let me make sure that this is actually selected. Yeah, it is cool. And you know, first thing that gets run, well, if you look up here, actually, right, this is this is the first it's, we're gonna call our payload main. And our payload main is gonna have this encrypted shell code, although it's not really shell code, it's a text file, but have our decryption string. Essentially, we're gonna derive our first key. I keep appending all these different keys that we drive to each other. And then we're going to pass it to, well, we're going to decode it. We're going to make it ASCII first, or we're going to into, make it into like a byte, like array, um, should, should I say. And then we're going to pass both the shell and, and key to our the decryption key to our uh, decryption function, which is all the way up here. And essentially what's happening in the back end, if you're curious, is they're just like Jinja templates that are used to kind of like glue all this stuff together. Um, but here's your, here's your decryptor. It's going to, you know, basically decrypt your shellcode, turn it. They're going to execute your shellcode using your executor function, which is this big mess here. Is, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's it, really. All right. I'm going to go back to PowerPoint. Start wrapping this up because we're beginning to run out of time. Um, how do I do that? Ah, I found the button again. All right, cool. So that was our key stack. Um, last, last little kind of feature that's baked into this. 
are pre-modules and post-modules. So what are these? Well, essentially, sometimes it's advantageous to have something that executes prior to your shell code or immediately after your shell code finishes it, that executing. Um, so for example, uh, like a pre-module that could be useful is, is an AMC bypass. We mentioned AMC. Well, there are actually a bunch of ways to bypass AMC out there. And you know, you might want to run that right out of the box before you do anything further. Well, if you, you know, pre-modules allow you to do that. You can say, I want to load this particular AMC bypass and run it uh, before my shell code. Um, and you know, sandbox checks. If you don't even want to do any of this stuff unless you check that you're like not in some sandbox somewhere, right? Like not in a virtual machine or, or whatever. Um, you know, you could essentially, you know, start stacking those those sandbox checks subroutines as pre-modules as well. Uh, Post-modules, uh, similar concept, just it's executing after the payload execution. So if you have, if you have a cleanup task and you want to, uh, you know, delete stuff from disk or, you know, do some log file deletion or modification, anything really, um, after your payload terminates, um, that's how you, you, that's something that you could implement using a, a post-module. Um, both pre-modules and post-modules are completely modular and mutable, pretty much like the rest of the, com the payload components. Um, you can see in here, you know, essentially you just take all your preload modules or pre-modules and post-modules and kind of put them, you know, before or after everything else that we just talked about. So I'm going to do the... Demo. Okay. All right, so here's an example of, uh, well, two examples of using pre modules. Um, and I'm going to do the opposite of what I did last, uh, last time. I'm going to show you kind of how they're being incorporated to the payloads first. And then, you know, I'll, I'll uh, um, actually execute them so you can see them. Uh, but you see this first example here, we have several pre modules loaded. Uh, we have a, a bunch of sandbox checks. Uh, this one here is just going to, since it's a sandbox check, you, you look for the minimal number of USBs that have ever been plugged in. Uh, so if it's a sandbox, you probably don't have a whole lot of, it, like a keyboard and a mouse <laughs> plugged into it, right? So, you know, that's that's essentially going to, you know, be some, a way you could do that. Um, you also have your, your, your MC bypass here that's kind of executing at the end of that. Um, so if we go ahead and generate that, right? Uh, our, our plain text shell here. We have example.cs publish. You'll see that our pre modules and payload main all get included right before everything else we just talked about. And they're just included up here in the actual definition somewhere. So if you actually want to run that, let's take this, but this time let's use our real shell code. Actually, call that directory. No. Okay. And let's start a new step or our new handler. And yeah, so now we've just essentially done all that stuff, right? And if I were to execute that from VM, that wouldn't work. Also, MZ is going to be disabled for that one process. <laughs> Gotta kill this stuff and then on. Switch back. Oh, that was not looking at hyper, was it? Well, that was useless. Okay. <laughs> All right, let me go back to that um, really fast. Quick review. <laughs> Start the handle. Boom. Everything, everything it, it works. Okay. And finally, and what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, here's our payload man name. Here are our free models that we added. And they're just implemented somewhere up here. We don't really care about that. Okay, going back to now, going back to PowerPoint. All right, I'm going to skip that one because time is running out. Um, okay, so 
Yeah, um, essentially, as far as like creating drop engine mod modules goes, um, so the goal of this project really isn't to provide a you know a bunch of pre-baked methods for bypassing AB and EDR. That's not really the point. It's kind of counterproductive if you know there are people who've tried to do stuff like that in the past, and it ends up just being a kind of a cat and mouse, mouse game where, and the performance if you start releasing stuff like that doesn't last very long. And um, really, the goal here, I mean, there's two goals for this, right? For you know, red teams, the, the goal of this project is, is to allow them to gain maximum value from their payloads um, by converting them into to reusable module. This is particularly true for consulting companies because they typically have much shorter time spans um, um, during which to do this stuff. Uh, whereas like internal teams can drag this stuff out over months. Uh, for defenders, this is also really, really useful because it allows you to quickly create large sets of sample payloads um, from which to build an alerting strategy. So, you know, the, basically, um, from a defender's perspective, what you want is data, and you know something like this. Um, particularly if you leverage an API, uh, you can you can very quickly create large amounts of sample data from which to uh, derive detections and signatures and all kinds of stuff. Um, so, so we've got two types of modules: input modules, that's everything that's going in to the interface to generate the payload, and output modules, and that's responsible for the rendering the payload itself. And so the input modules. Um, they always pretty much correspond to, you know, one or more matching output modules, and they're really, you know, pretty much simple to, um, to, to implement. Just a hair from base uh, class, uh, and then you create a constructor, which should always call it. Yeah, it's it's pretty, you know, self-explanatory to look at docs, to be honest. Uh, major shout out to to, to bike leader, uh, um, or Marcello, because uh, you know, without his previous work for dynamic module loading, that's you know, for with silent trimity and crack map tech, probably this wouldn't look quite as good because I, I kind of simplified what he did and abstracted a little more of the functionality away from the module devs and added a central dispatcher, which is pretty neat. And output modules essentially, if you want to build a corresponding output module, um, all that you need to do is you know, define a bunch of, of, of metadata and then just point it toward a Jinja template. Um, and that's pretty much it. And I'm actually not going to show you how to do this because it's going to take forever. Um, but yeah, uh, if you're interested in checking out the project, it is on GitHub, um, uh, solstice slash drop engine. And that's it. I'm going to open this up for questions and what have you. Sure. Um, listen, man, thanks very much for that. That was that was pretty cool. Um, I'll leave your slide up to for people to follow you in GitHub, but then I'll I'll flip it back to your. In fact, no, you don't have a camera, do you? Oh, um, is it showing? It's just while I'm getting up the questions. Um, can Can you see it in the bottom right? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. That's that's good, man. We just want to see your pretty face all up close. Um, there's been no questions in the chat, although people are welcome to post questions in the chat. And if you're if you're on Zoom, absolutely ask away. Um, however, I do want to point out there have been a couple of people that have said, pray to the demo gods now, F in the chat for LS being missing. Um, genuinely, I've not seen a presentation with as many demos in it that went fluidly. So massive hats off to you there. That is that is serious, serious praying that you put into the demo gods there, man. Thanks, no, um, really cool presentation. Does anyone have any questions for Solstice? Cool. I, I would absolutely recommend check out his GitHub page. Um, go. I mean, you're going to be hanging out in the Slack, right? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so people can ask you questions, speak to you there. Yeah. Um, no, listen, man, you want to hang around in the zoom. That's cool. You want to, cool. is there anything else you want to just kind of wrap up? You've still got about four minutes so you can, you can, you can um, shill something, man. No, I think that'll do it. <laughs> no, you good? You don't want to promote Raid Shadow Legends or no? I'm just I'm joking with you, man. Um, listen, that was that was brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, thank you. Thank you.